Hi, I'm Tony Northup, and this is my tutorial for the Sony A7R Mark IV. This isn't a typical tutorial. I'm gonna assume if you bought this camera that you kinda know what you're doing. You don't need me to walk you through aperture priority, shutter priority. I've spent, I don't know, like a month with this camera so far, really using it for our professional work. So I'm gonna teach you the ins and outs of working with it. I'm going to assume you've used a Sony, Canon, or Nikon camera. You might be coming from a DSLR or another mirrorless camera. All the tips and tricks that will help you work around the quirks of this camera. First, subscribe, it's free. We have lots of useful reviews and tutorials. Also, if you want to send your friends to a tutorial for a different camera, send them to sdp.io slash tutorials. We have hour long tutorials for more than 50 cameras and they're all absolutely free. If you want the PDF of the manual for this camera, which is useful for searching for a particular feature, especially when you're out in the field, use this URL. I suggest downloading that PDF to your smartphone so that even if you don't have internet access, you can quickly pull it up and do a find. Sony regularly updates the firmware on their cameras and these updates can fix bugs and add new features. So definitely search for Sony a7R 4 firmware update. Obviously I'm working with the latest one at this time, but later on there might be new ones. Let's first talk about the batteries on this camera. Obviously the battery is hidden under here. You've probably found this already. This camera does support USB charging, so you do not need to travel with the included battery charger. You can charge it using one of two ports, either the micro USB port on the bottom here or the USB-C port on the top here. The USB-C port charges fast, the micro USB port charges very slow. Either will get you fully charged if you just plug it in at night like you do your smartphone and when I travel, that's what I do. Word of caution, the USB-C charger here does not work with my MacBook Pro USB-C charger. In fact, the only USB-C charger I found it works with is like a standard old-timey USB-A to USB-C charger, if that makes sense to you. So anyway, before you travel, if you're planning to use USB-C, make sure you test the charger out so you're not caught stranded which actually happened to me. I would suggest buying an extra, what they call a Sony Z battery and traveling with it because there's nothing worse than running out of batteries. I caution you against third-party generic batteries. They will work for a while, but my experience has always been that they tend to flake out suddenly and might leave you stranded. So for that reason, for all camera manufacturers, I stick with the original OEM batteries. This camera has two UHS-2 memory card slots in it. You can see they pop out like this. I strongly suggest writing both stills and video to both cards simultaneously. Not too long ago, we polled over 4,000 photographers and we found that almost half of them had had a memory card failure at some point during their career that resulted in a loss of photos. The more pictures people took, the more likely they were to have a failure. Up to about 75% of people who'd shot more than a million pictures had experienced some kind of failure. You don't want to lose your important photos because you had an SD card failure. So put two UHS-2 cards in there. UHS-2 cards are faster. And then set the camera up to write to both cards by hitting the menu button up here. We're going to scroll up to the top. You can see there are tabs at the top here. So I'm scrolling through the tabs over to the toolbox, and then I'm gonna go down and go to setup page five. Now at the bottom of setup page five, we see rec media settings. That's very confusing. So as we select that, we can ignore this first option of prioritizing it. What we want to adjust is recording mode. We're gonna select that, and then we're gonna select simult and then stills and video. And so right there, that will simultaneously record whatever your settings are to both the first and the second card. Sometimes, especially when I travel, I like to write RAW to one card and JPEG to the second card. This allows me to pull out the second card and know that there are only JPEGs on there and JPEGs tend to load faster onto my computer or smartphone. So in case I want to go through something quickly and I don't want to be, deal with the big RAW files, I'll instead choose sort raw slash JPEG, and that'll cause it to write raw to card one, or whatever you selected as the main card, and then JPEG to the other card. JPEGs aren't a perfect backup, but they're kind of better than nothing. Here's a suggestion for a UHS-2 SD card. Um, the Lexar Professionals are a good compromise between cost and performance. Certainly, you can get cards that, that claim to have 350 megabytes per second, but in the real world, they don't really operate anywhere near these capacities anyway. This sdp.io link will take you there. I would get 
two of the 256 gig cards, which will cost you about 150 bucks. 256 gigs might seem like an impossibly high capacity for you, but these are 60 megapixel files. And if you go into pixel shift, a set of 16 pixel shift files runs about two gigabytes. So that's one picture it takes up two gigabytes. And to reliably capture one picture, you need to take about 10 images. So in one scene, you might easily shoot 20 gigabytes of data. So you're not going to be upset that you bought the bigger cards. I'm also going to suggest that you buy some cheap SD cards, keep them around in different places for emergencies. Here's a story you saved my butt, an email I got. You can pause it and read it if you want. But the summary is, if you, you will at some point forget your SD cards, or you will have failures or something. It always happens. So I buy a stack of cheap SD cards, put one in my every suitcase, every bag, in my glove compartment, in my wife's purse. I just hide them throughout my life. And then when I need them, I know that they're there, and I've saved more than a few butts, butts by using that trick. My single biggest challenge with all of the Sony cameras is sensor dust. Like no other camera, they attract sensor dust, even when they're brand new. Even when I've only put one lens on and have never changed it, I end up with sensor dust. Before every important shoot with these Sony cameras, I have to clean the sensor, or I'm going to waste a bunch of time in post removing that dust manually. Here is the sensor cleaning setup that I use. You can purchase it at this sdp.io link here. And if you want a video tutorial on how to actually clean the sensor, this is free. Go to sdp.io slash clean. Let's go over the physical ports on the camera. In the upper left of the left side of the camera here, we have, this is baffling to me, a PC sync port. This port goes back to, I think, like the teens, like 19 teens or 1920. So it's probably 100 years old, used to trigger studio strobes. It is a terrible port. This PC sync port will always regularly fall off and ruin your shots. I haven't used one in a long, long time nowadays. Flashes, strobes are always triggered through the hot shoe on the top. That's there. Don't ever use it unless you absolutely have to. Under the second door here, we have headphone and mic jacks that are indicated with their color. And then we have a micro HDMI port in case you wanted to hook it up to a field monitor to record video externally, or just to use it as like a flip forward screen or something. You will need a micro HDMI to HDMI cable. That cable will come loose because micro HDMI is very flaky and that will screw up your recording. <laughs> so if you're going to do that, I suggest getting some sort of cage that holds the cable in place. It's not reliable. And as I introduced earlier below that, we have USB-C and micro USB ports. USB-C is the newer, faster generation. If you're going to do wired tethering with this camera, be sure to use USB-C and connect it to either a USB-C or USB-3 port on the device that you're tethering to. There's no real reason you should ever use the micro USB port except to use a remote trigger, which we'll talk about in just another second. Let's go over the controls on this camera. They're all pretty basic. On the top, just like every old DSLR from the 50s, we have this mode dial here that allows you to change the auto exposure mode program, aperture priority, shutter priority, and manual mode. We have a green auto mode. That's the mode I switch to if I'm going to hand somebody else my camera to take a picture, just to make everything simple and sort of erase all my crazy customizations. We have video mode here for quickly recording video, though you can always hit the record button here in any mode to start recording a video. Switching to the video mode will like show your levels and give you your nice 16 by 9 crop before you start recording, so it's useful to do that. S and Q is confusingly named. It basically means slow and quick motion. So slow motion video or fast motion video, something with an unusual frame rate. And then we have modes one, two, and three here for just recalling a group of settings that you've previously saved. And I'll show you how to do that in just another couple of minutes. For me, I always end up in aperture priority mode by default. The buttons and dials have changed from other generations of cameras, but pretty much any camera you're using, you'll find them to be pretty familiar. One of these will adjust the aperture, one of them will adjust the shutter, and that's fairly obvious. The exposure compensation dial here on top has changed from previous generations of cameras in that it now locks. It's different from the mode dial. The mode dial, to turn it, you have to hold the middle button down always and turn it. With the exposure compensation dial, it clicks on and off. So when it's down, it's locked, and I cannot accidentally 
turn it. That used to be a real problem on earlier cameras, so now that's not a problem. But if you decide, oh, I quickly need to add an additional stop of exposure while you're shooting, you will need to take a second, unlock it, and then adjust it. And then after you're done shooting and changing the exposure compensation, remember to always dial it back to zero because unlike other cameras, it does not automatically reset because that's not physically possible. There's a thumbstick on the back here that you can use to change the focusing point. By default, you cannot touch the screen to change the focusing point, but you can touch the trash can to turn touch operation on and that will turn touch operation on, and then when you touch the screen, it will focus on the point that you've selected. You can quickly change a variety of common settings by hitting the FN button, and here you can see it allows me to change the drive mode and the focusing mode and the focusing area and a few other settings. Those are very convenient, and I'll show you in just a few minutes how to customize this. We have an AF on button here in a predictable space, as well as an auto exposure locking button which you can customize both of those buttons. We also have two custom buttons on the top. I often get emails from people who are panicked because their camera no longer focuses accurately, and often the cause of this is actually the diopter. The diopter dials in a glasses prescription into your viewfinder, and if the diopter is accidentally hit, then it will seem like the entire viewfinder is out of focus. So all of us should do this on a brand new camera. Every new camera that we get, hold the viewfinder up to your eye, don't look through it, but look down at the, at the letters at the bottom of the screen and then adjust this little diopter right here. If you pick up somebody else's camera, that's the first thing you should do. And when you hand it back to them, you should remind them, don't forget to adjust the diopter back. It does get hit accidentally, so if everything's blurry, remember, dial it in by looking at the letters on the bottom of the screen. By default, this camera beeps every time it acquires focus. That's infuriating. We want to turn that off immediately. I'll hit the menu button, then I'll go up to the tabs, go to camera two tab, page 11. I'm going to select audio signals and set that to off. Everyone around you will thank you for not beeping all the time. I'm going to show you my standard method for selecting a focusing point and focusing, which is different from other cameras. This camera, the new Sony A9, the new Sony A6400, they have what's called Sony's real-time autofocus system. It tracks subjects in continuous autofocus as they move around the frame, and it's really amazing. It means to me that I no longer have to use the thumbstick to move the focusing point around. I don't have to manually select a focusing point by touching the screen. Instead, I always use what resembles old-time focus recompose. I'll show you how I do it. The first thing I'll do is I'll select continuous shutter to shoot multiple pictures. That's not really related to this. I just find that convenient. I always rattle off a few pictures at a time. That's especially important on a high megapixel camera like this because camera shake is much more obvious. Missed focus is much more obvious. So taking multiple pictures improves your chances that at least one is going to be super, super sharp. Now that I have multiple pictures shot at the same time, I'm going to go to the second option here, which is the focus mode. AFA is useless to serious photographers. It switches between single and continuous autofocus. On this camera, I always use continuous autofocus AFC. So I'll select that. Now I'm going to hit FN once more, and I'm going to change the focus area. My favorite focus area is the very last option here, tracking, and then I'm going to go to center. Tracking center keeps the focusing point on the middle. You obviously don't want to always focus on the middle of the frame. I'll show you what I do. Let's say I want to focus on the T in the screen there, but I want the T to be on the left side of the frame. I'll put the T in the middle, I'll half press the shutter so it locks focus, and then I can recompose. So I could also just move the thumbstick to put on the left side of the frame and focus, but that would take significantly longer. Always using the center part of the frame and then focus and recomposing happens very, very quickly. It's very reliable on this camera, and I just find it's an overall better workflow. Of course, you have to have it in AFC, but it will track slight changes in focus as you're recomposing. Earlier I showed you that touch to focus will change the focusing point, even if you have center autofocus selected. Something I find more useful is turning on touch tracking. That will allow you to touch something and have it track it as it moves around the screen, much like your smartphone does. To do that, I'll hit the menu, 
I'll go up to the tabs here and it's camera two, page 10. Funk of touch operation. So I'll select that and then I'll select touch tracking. And now once again, I'll focus on, I'll focus on this T here, I'll touch it. And now you can see as I move the camera around, it continually tracks that. Again, I can touch it and then decide to recompose my shot and it will continue to autofocus. I also wanna suggest you turn off the autofocus illuminator. In dim environments, this camera has a little light here that will light up, disturbing everybody in the area. And it will help it autofocus more accurately by adding light to the scene, but I find it to be very disturbing especially if you're shooting a nice moment in a wedding, you don't want to suddenly be the guy who's like shining a what looks like a cell phone flashlight. Hit the menu button, go to the camera one tab, and then over to page six, and you'll see AF Illuminator. I'll select that, and then I will select off so it will never come on. I'm gonna take a second to plug our sponsor, which is me. <laughs> I've written a whole bunch of books about photography, about post-processing, Lightroom, and Photoshop. The book Stunning Digital Photography is a video book with more than 14 hours of video. It's been the number one photography book in the world since like 2013. If you look on Amazon, it has more than 2,000 reviews. So you could pick it up from Amazon, help support me, or you could go directly to our store at sdp.io slash store. The ebook version starts at 10 bucks, or you can get the paper book, paperback version, and either one has 14 hours or more of video. Our books on Lightroom and Photoshop are also video books with tons of video training built in. So you don't just get a book, but you get video training too. I have a photography buying guide that will help you pick out cameras and lenses and studio strobes and tripods and all that other gear. And then for the really serious photographers, we have our art and science of photography video training series, which will take your photography deeper than YouTube tutorials ever could. And we also have a portrait professional training series that you can find at the same link for those of you who really want to make money as a working portrait photographer. It can make you tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars. So they're all a really good value. Check them out at northrup.photo. Let's talk about back button focus. If you don't know what back button focus is, head to sdp.io slash ybb, where I have a video tutorial that will show you why I use it and why it's made such a big difference in the workflows of just thousands and thousands of photographers. To turn it on on this camera, it's a two-step process. First, I'll hit the menu button here. I'm gonna to go to the camera one tab. I'm gonna to go to page six. And then I'm going to go down to the last option, AF with shutter, and I'm going to set that to off. What this does is it decouples focusing from the shutter button. So now when I half press the shutter, it no longer attempts to autofocus. And actually that's it. Earlier I said this was a two-step process, but AFON is already programmed, so it's just a one-step process. But now let's talk about eye autofocus. If you focus on something with an eye, humans or sometimes even animals, it can find the eye in the frame and automatically focus on it. And for portrait photography, this can really speed up the process of selecting an eye. But there are a few caveats you should know about. The most important is that it is not perfect. I have gotten a shockingly low percentage of eye autofocus shots on this camera in focus, especially when shooting with something like the 85 F1.4, which has a very shallow depth of field. If you're shooting tight headshots, you'll find that it will focus on the eyelashes instead of the eye itself. Because at 60 megapixels with a sharp lens and shallow depth of field, the accuracy required is greater than the accuracy that the camera is giving you. It's basically focusing on the first thing it sees, which might be eyelashes or it could be the brow, and you will notice that with such a high megapixel file. There's an easy solution to that. And if you're using back button focus, hold back button focus down until it acquires focus, and then let go. And while you're shooting continuously, lean in and out, just like that. Just very slight leaning in and out, enough to cover the distance from the eyelashes to the eye. Shooting continuously at 10 frames per second, you can just shoot for half a second or one second, but during the course of that shooting, one of those pictures is bound to be sharper. So to recap, use back button focus, hold back button focus down until it gets focus. Then release the back button focus and at the same time start shooting while leaning in and out. When you're processing, you will go through those and pick the one that is most precise. You do not need this 
all the time, but if you're shooting with shallow depth of field, like at 85 f1.4 and tight headshots, then it can be an absolute lifesaver. I also want to show you how to set eye detect AF specifically to a separate custom button. Hit the menu button, go to camera page two here, and then we're going to go over to page this page six, and then hit this top option here, custom key. And instead of AEL hold, a feature I never use, I'm going to select that, and then I'm going to select IAF. IAF on page six. So I'll select that. So now, when I'm doing a portrait session, instead of hitting AF on, I will hit AEL. And that will always focus on an I. Or if I just generally want to focus on something, I can switch to using AF on. So now my thumb knows over here is portraits and over here is general shooting. The disp button is really useful. Disp is here on the directional pad, pushing it up. And it changes the information that's displayed. You can see as I switch here, first it has this sort of cluttered display with lots of stuff I don't care about displayed. If I push it again, it gives me a clean viewfinder, which I like. It helps me focus on the composition. If I push it again, it gives me a histogram, which helps me nail the exposure. If you aren't comfortable using histograms, check out my book, Stunning Digital Photography, where I describe that. Or push it up again, and it gives you a level, which is a lifesaver when you're shooting landscapes, because I've never shot a level shot <laughs> without needing some kind of help. You can also use the disc button to change the display when you have your eye up to the viewfinder. Just hold it up to your eye, and then push it, and you will see it switch between those different modes. Frequently asked question, you cannot see a histogram and the level at the same time. You kind of have to switch between them. You can customize a couple of aspects of it though. Hit the menu button, go to the camera tab two, and then go over to page seven. The first option here is disc button. So you can select it for either the monitor, which is this screen, or the finder, which is your electronic viewfinder. And then you can turn on or off different modes. So if you never want to see display all info, you can just turn that off and never have to see it again. I'm going to select monitor off and then press enter. You can't simply hit the shutter button to get out of there or it won't take. I'll hit enter, and now if I hit the disc button to go to monitor off, it turns off the rear screen entirely. This is really useful when shooting in dark environments, like if you're shooting a club or a show, and the rear screen is so blindingly bright that it's attracting attention to you, disturbing the people around you, or just throwing off your night vision. Turn it off, and then you can hold your eye up to use the viewfinder. You're basically turning off the rear display and only using the viewfinder. This is also good if you find that the viewfinder is constantly switching between the rear screen and the electronic viewfinder because it has that sort of auto-detect thing going on. So sometimes I just like to turn it off. It doesn't actually save you batteries. It turns out the electronic viewfinder generally burns more batteries than the rear screen. The menu systems on the Sony are a nightmare. As a guy who was a developer and used to create user interfaces, it's like an example of what not to do. I will try to give you my best practices for living with this chaotic, crazy menu system. <laughs> uh, first of all, you should know it is not a touch screen. You can't swipe or any of that. There is no searching. You just have to go page by page by page through unsorted menu items when you want to find the, the item that you want. There's a little bit of help, like the trash can here. The trash can button will tell you a little bit about that menu item, and sometimes that helps to give you a clue, but it's not great. When you push it here, it gives you some help, but it's always text. It doesn't visually show you something. And also the descriptions are often completely useless. Like if I select S and Q settings and hit the trash can, it says sets S and Q motion settings. But you, that would be a good opportunity to tell you what S and Q meant, right? No, they don't, they don't do that. So I tell you it's there, but it's rarely useful. You're probably better off pulling up that link for the PDF of the manual and searching through it. Something that helps tremendously is to use my menu. Once you get into the menu system here, go to the star tab, 
This allows you to create a custom menu with your most frequently used settings. Select the first item here, add item, and then you can flip through so many different pages of settings to find those things that you most frequently access. And you know how you shoot better than anybody else in the world. So as you use an option, add it to my menu. The first time you have to dig through the whole menu system to find some obscure option, go ahead and add it to my menu. I wish it had like a recently used items or frequently used items. It's not smart like that. You just have to manually add it to it. I also suggest using the FN button here and customizing it. You can customize all of these and I'll show you how to do that. Hit the menu button here, go over to the camera two, and then scroll over to page nine, function menu set. Select that and now you can go through here and select those settings that you most frequently use. For example, I don't ever change the metering mode. So I could select that and then change it to something that I found to be more useful. And for example, I do change peaking on a regular basis. So I'll set that to peak. And then instead of having to dig through the menus to find peak next time, I'll be able to just hit function and then jump right to turning peaking on. For those settings that you're accessing most frequently, assign them to a custom button. That's done from the same menu. Hit menu here and go up to, you'll see three custom key menu items that are different only by the icon that they use. The first is custom keys when you're shooting stills. The second is custom keys when you're reviewing pictures. And the third is custom keys when you're working in the video mode. So when I'm shooting stills, I'll select that. I never change the white balance because I always shoot raw and do it manually anyway, so I never need to use C1 as the white balance setting. So I select that, and what I set it to is APS-C 35 full frame select. So now I've customized that. I can immediately switch to APS-C mode. By pushing that button, you can see it's cropping in the picture, giving me a little bit more digital zoom at the touch of a finger. And if you follow those tips and read the manual, you can actually learn to live with the Sony menu system. Let's talk about turning on RAW. By default, this camera is set to shoot JPEG, which is a highly compressed format. JPEGs throw out a lot of valuable highlight and shadow information. JPEGs are fine for most shooting situations. And if you're shooting sports, or some kind of action where you're taking a whole lot of pictures, the smaller file size of JPEGs can actually be a big benefit. But for other situations like landscapes, maybe weddings, you might want to shoot RAW. To turn on RAW, hit the menu button. It's on the very first menu here. You'll see file format, set to JPEG by default, set it to RAW. Or if you might want to use the JPEG files for something, you can set it to RAW plus JPEG. RAW plus JPEG is actually kind of nice because like Lightroom's processing of the RAW files, I often like it less than Sony's own internal processing. So often I do just want to start with a JPEG file and make my life a little bit easier. But really, I'm probably in RAW most of the time. The next option down is RAW file type, and you can choose between either compressed or uncompressed. Compressed files are about half the size of the uncompressed RAW files, and the uncompressed RAW files are huge. They're both huge, <laughs> but the uncompressed is twice as big. These are not losslessly compressed files. So the compressed files are smaller, but you will occasionally see artifacts in areas of extreme contrast. So if you're shooting stars, you should be shooting uncompressed because some stars could disappear. If you're shooting like a backlit scene inside of a church or something, the compressed RAW file might introduce a few artifacts that would be solved with the uncompressed RAW file. But again, I pretty much always leave it in compressed RAW file just to reduce my file sizes a little bit. I briefly talked about the APS-C Super 35 mode. What this mode does is it crops the sensor down 1.5 times to be the same surface area as an APS-C camera like the Sony A6400 or A6600. This is not something you want to do on a daily basis. It's usually better to use the full width of the sensor. However, when I'm shooting sports, and I'm usually shooting with a 70 to 200, if the team is on the other side of the field and I need more reach, I will switch into APS-C mode in order to crop down and get that little bit of extra reach. It is exactly like cropping in post, but by cropping in camera, 
I see the cropped view in my viewfinder, which helps me compose it. Also, the cropped files are smaller, so they record faster to the cards, and I'm not wasting as much SD card space or drive space if I was going to have to crop it anyway. APS-C mode is also useful for wildlife where you're often cropping. So earlier I showed you how to assign it to a custom function key, and that allows you to pretty instantly switch like this. One caveat here is if you're shooting continuously and the camera buffers, then you're going to get this unable to write to memory card, and then you have to wait for the entire buffer to clear before you can switch again. So what's happened when I was shooting sports is I'll be shooting some intense action in APS-C mode, and then, oh, the game starts to get close to me and I need to switch back to wide, and I can't switch. So just be aware of that, and when in doubt, shoot at the wider setting if you think you might suddenly need to switch back so that you're not caught off guard. You can manually change this from the menu system by going to camera one, page one, the last item here. It's set to auto by default, but you can turn it on or off to make sure that it never switches over. Auto will allow you to put on APS-C lenses, something designed for an A6500, and use them as if you were using an APS-C camera, but there's no real reason to ever do that. You should be using full-frame lenses if you're using this big old body. I'll say, when it crops, the resulting files are 28 megapixels. That's the full resolution, 61 megapixels, divided by the crop, 1.5 squared. So 61 divided by 2.25 yields 28 megapixel files. Let's talk about the focus magnifier, which zooms in while you're taking a picture. I find this super, super useful, especially when manually focus on thing, focusing, when doing macro photography or astrophotography. Here's how you set it up to a custom key. I'm going to hit the menu button here. I'm going to go to the custom key settings, which are on camera tab 2, page 9. And then I'm going to select custom key. And what I assign it to is the trash can button, because I never need to change the touch operation. I always leave that to tracking. So I'm going to go to page 14 here and set it to focus magnifier. So now as I'm viewing the screen, let's focus on that. And then if I want to zoom in to verify the focus, well, okay, first I have to get it out of AFC and let's put it into manual focus, but this is probably a scenario where I'd be using manual focus. I'll push the trash can. I can move this where I want to focus around using the thumbstick. And then when I'm ready, I will hit the center button here and now it moves in. And now I can really finally control the focusing so I absolutely nail focus. So that's exactly what I do when I'm looking at stars. Pushing the center button again zooms in even tighter, so now I'm at 11.9 times, just giving me that much more precision. Let's talk about reviewing photos that you've taken. Obviously, you'll hit the play button down here, and then you can scroll back, Here's a photo I took for a local park that I'm working for. If I hit the disk button here, you can see it changes the view, provides me histogram information if I want it, as well as my settings, just like in the regular mode. I can also zoom in. No, you can't use your fingers. You'd think you could, but you can't do that. Instead, you'll hit the AF on button up here. It has a little magnifying glass next to it. That zooms in to a moderate distance. You can zoom in further, or you can back out with the AEL button. Once you're zoomed in, you can pan around with your finger, but you cannot pinch or pull like that. So it's a little bit clumsy to go to. When you're zoomed all the way back, you can hit the AEL button to zoom back even further and go to a thumbnail view or even a calendar view to just help you navigate photos a little bit quicker, and then you'll punch in again by zooming in like that. You can review your pictures either using the rear screen or by holding the camera up to your eye. I find the viewfinder to be much easier, especially in bright situations, so I can really double check that I nailed focus and everything is sharp. And that's something you wanna review your pictures more often with this camera than with any other camera, because the 61 megapixels means your mistakes will be much more obvious. If your camera was a little bit shaky, if you misfocus by a tiny amount, it will be so much more obvious because of all that extra detail. So make a point of double checking your pictures more often after you take them. I love to rate my pictures in the field 
because it improves my overall workflow. So if I'm doing a portrait shoot and this one picture had just like the perfect expression, but I took a thousand pictures and I don't want to dig through those thousand pictures to find that one picture, well, while I'm reviewing it in the studio, I will immediately rate it and I'll rate it like four stars. Then when I import it into Lightroom, I can just filter out everything but the four star photos and I'll be able to quickly find my picture. Here is how I set up the camera to rate quickly while reviewing pictures. I'll hit the menu button here. I'll go to camera tab two. I'll select the third custom key menu item. This is for reviewing pictures. And then for item one, which is C3 up here, it's set to protect by default. I'll select it and then I will select rating instead. And by default, it lets me select all five possible star ratings and that's fine. And now I will select enter. So now, when I'm reviewing pictures, let's say I love this picture, I can select C3 four times to make it four stars, five times for five stars, or I can just keep going through zero through five stars to give it the rating I want, thus making post-processing and culling much, much faster, especially for times when you quickly want to get pictures up on social media shortly after an event. Some people like to automatically review their pictures. This camera is not set to automatically review after you're taking pictures. If you want that, hit the menu button, go up to camera tab two. We're gonna go over to page eight and then select auto review and set it to two seconds, five seconds, or 10 seconds. Auto review definitely wastes a lot of batteries and I don't often use it. I don't mind hitting the play button, but I, there are situations where I always wanna review the picture, so I do sometimes turn it on. I'm not going to cover things like aperture shutter manual mode, but if you want more details about them, you can check out the tutorials we have here. They're fairly obvious. These links are all taking you to free videos that go super in-depth about things like picking the perfect aperture, shutter speed, and ISO, as well as getting the most out of manual mode. We make it as easy as possible. If you ever shoot in a studio with strobes, where strobes are your main lights, you will find this camera by default is incredibly frustrating to use because you are using manual mode and you're using manual ISO, but the lights aren't on while you're previewing your picture and thus your viewfinder will typically be very dark. There's one setting that you have to change that will make the operation more like a traditional DSLR where you're looking through the viewfinder but not seeing an attempted preview of the exposure. To change it into what I call studio mode, hit the menu button, go up to the camera two tab, go down to page eight, and then go down to live view display. By default, it's set to setting effect on. Select that and then select setting effect off. With setting effect off, if I adjust the exposure compensation, you can see the preview of the display does not change. That is bad for normal shooting, but if you're shooting with strobes where the strobes aren't firing constantly, then it's a very good thing because it allows you to still see through the viewfinder and use it. So. When I'm not shooting in the studio, I always have setting effect set to on. Bulb mode allows you to take exposures for longer than the normal maximum of 30 seconds. I'm gonna show you how to do that. First of all, you'll put the camera into manual mode. You would want to manually set the ISO, let's say to ISO 100 or whatever it is that you're doing, and then adjust the shutter speed all the way left. Once I get to 30 seconds, I'm just going to go one click further and, oh look, it's not letting me go any further. It's not letting me select bulb mode. This is weird, but it's because I have the drive mode set to continuous. In order to select bulb mode, you have to switch to single shooting shutter. So I set it to single shooting shutter and now I can scroll left and switch over into bulb mode again. Now the shutter will stay open as long as I hold my finger on the shutter. If I hold it down for five seconds, it takes a five second exposure. If I hold my finger on the shutter for 10 minutes, it takes a 10 minute exposure. I don't wanna stand there for 10 minutes with my finger on the shutter though. So what you do is you get a locking remote trigger like this $12 USB gadget here that you can pick up at this link. This is my favorite one because it does not require batteries. So it's one more thing that can't fail. This is micro USB, so you will connect it to the micro USB connector on the bottom left behind this little 
weather sealed door. That remote locking shutter is also useful for shooting star trails, meteors, and lightning. In those situations, I'll typically set the camera to shoot like five or 10 second exposures and then lock the shutter open. I'll leave it in continuous mode so the camera's just basically taking eternally taking pictures at five or 10 second intervals with absolutely no delay between them. And then I will just pick the pictures that have lightning in them or combine everything together for star trails. Those are both techniques I discuss in stunning digital photography if you want more info. But if you're gonna do that, you should turn off long exposure noise reduction. Long exposure noise reduction will take a blank frame after every frame. Like if you take a 30 second exposure, it'll then take a blank 30 second exposure and combine it. But as a result, your star trails would end up with these big gaps. So be sure to turn off long exposure noise reduction. It's on camera tab one, page two. Long exposure noise reduction is set to off now. I always leave that off. By the way, if you're shooting stars, this is my favorite astrophotography lens. It's the Sigma 14 millimeter F1.8 for Sony E-mount. It is incredibly big and heavy but it's the fastest, widest lens available, and I find it to be very, very sharp. It's really only good for manual focus. The autofocus is there, but it's very, very flaky. I also like Sigma's 20 millimeter F1.4 art lens, which is just not quite as wide. Like, I use the 20 millimeter for regular stars, and I'll use the 14 millimeter for Astro, but this camera's so high megapixel, it's pretty easy to shoot at 14 and then crop down. Here's a couple of tips for using the LCD and the electronic viewfinder. First, let's get into the menu system and go over to camera tab two, page seven. Here under finder slash monitor, if I select that, I can have it manually stuck to either the viewfinder or the monitor. So if you find it switching between both of those and in an annoying way, then set it to one or the other. For example, if I'm shooting landscapes, I might be on a tripod and I'll be making adjustments with my hand and you can kind of see, see how the monitor is turning on and off just because my thumb kind of went in front of it. That gets to be really infuriating. Sometimes it'll even be triggered by the screen depending on the lighting conditions or it'll be triggered by a strap or something. So in those situations, I'll go in and set it to monitor manual so it's not automatically switching back and forth. Another option you might want to set is on the same page, right below it, finder frame rate. I will typically set this to high. This just gives you a faster refresh on the electronic viewfinder up here, which makes tracking moving subjects a little bit easier and burns through a little extra battery. Once again, I'm going to plug my stuff because these videos are really hard. You probably already hear my voice falling apart, but we do it for you and we appreciate your support. You can pick up some of our photography educational materials. These are all books that we made ourselves in-house, not thrown through any other publisher. I have a big palette in my garage of these books. We literally do this stuff ourselves. Stunning Digital Photography, the number one photography book in the world, has more than 14 hours of video. We have video books on Lightroom and Photoshop for all your post-processing needs with tons of free video training in, in them. The Photography Buying Guide, and of course, our Art and Science and Portrait Professional Training Series. You can pick them all up at sdp.io slash store. They start at just 10 bucks. It's super cheap, especially because I know you just bought like a $3,500 camera. Don't be a cheapskate. <laughs> Let's talk about the different shutter modes available. For almost everything, I just use continuous shutter, which just takes pictures like bang, 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 bang. But when you get into this mode, you'll see there are a couple of different options. The default is continuous shooting high, which will shoot at, I think, eight frames per second. But there's also high plus, which shoots at, I think, 10 frames per second. The difference between these is high plus does not show you a real-time view of the world through the viewfinder. It shows you the last picture you took. So you could potentially be looking at a scene that's a little more than a tenth of a second behind. If you're shooting a stationary batter who's swinging a bat, switch to high plus. That extra few frames per second will be helpful to you in capturing that one decisive moment and you don't have to be following a moving subject with the viewfinder. If you're shooting a flying bird, you're going to be happier in high mode because you'll be able to see that real-time view. If you are trying to track a flying bird with a really big telephoto lens, you will find that you fall behind the subject because you are seeing a delayed view through the viewfinder. You can also set a self-timer here by selecting the third option. 
scroll to the left or right for two second, five second, or 10 second delays. Two second is useful if you're on a tripod and you just are using the regular shutter button and you wanna eliminate the shutter sit shake. Five seconds is what I use for pixel shift, which I'll discuss in just a minute because it needs that extra delay. And then 10 seconds is good for selfies where you're setting the camera and then running around in front of the camera. You can also do continuous bracketing, the fifth option down. This allows you to shoot at multiple different exposures so that you can combine them in post to create high dynamic range results. Bracketing and then combining into HDR greatly improves the dynamic range, allowing you to pull more detail out of highlights and shadows. It also effectively reduces the noise in the scene. You can do it using either hand-holding techniques or on a tripod. The way I combine them is with Adobe's Photo Merge and Lightroom Classic, not Lightroom CC, but Lightroom Classic. It works extremely well. It handles it automatically with almost no work from me. It will even eliminate ghosting. Check our deal with Adobe out at sdp.io slash Adobe deal. And again, don't get Lightroom CC, get Lightroom Classic. This camera will buffer. It has a very big buffer and can store a lot of pictures, but it will eventually fill up. So it's useful to keep track of how many shots you have left in the buffer. Let me get this into shutter priority mode. In order to keep an eye on how many shots you have left in the buffer, you can turn on a continuous shooting length. Hit the menu button, go to camera tab two, page eight. Cont shoot length, select that, and then select shoot only display. Now I'm going to shoot continuously here and show you what kind of what goes on. Now see along the left side here how that lights up. As I'm shooting continuously, it's the bar is getting smaller and smaller. And when it gets all the way down to the bottom, that's when my camera starts buffering and slowing down. Keep an eye on that when you're shooting action and you'll be able to manage your buffer a little bit better and it will be less likely that you're going to run out of buffer space. I'll mention even with top-end UHS-2 cards, it takes a long time for the buffer to unload and when you're doing that you can enter the menu system but you can't change very many settings. So if you get into the situation where, oh my god, all my settings are blocked out, that's why. And you can see as soon as the buffer cleared, those settings come back and available. So just be a little bit patient. The A7R4 has a time-lapse feature built into it, an intervalometer where it will take pictures at a regular interval. To use that, hit the menu button, go to camera tab one, go over to page three, and then select interval shoot funk. Now there's a bunch of settings here, starting with interval shooting, which will turn to on, and then you'll set the shooting interval, how long you want to wait until it actually starts, the number of shots that it takes. I always set the number of shots to like 9,000. And then I just let it keep shooting as long as I feel like it. And then when I'm done with it, I will just turn it off. I've never like shot a time lapse and thought I had too many pictures. It's always like I didn't take enough pictures. So I try to let it go just as long as I can. If you're shooting a game of golf or you're a photojournalist and you need to shoot a funeral or if you're shooting a quiet moment of the wedding and you don't want to be that guy with the loud shutter, turn on silent shooting. It uses the electronic shutter and it's incredibly useful. Hit the menu button here, go up to camera tab two, page five. And then the top menu item here is silent shooting, turn it to on. Now when I take pictures, it doesn't make any noise. Don't use that for portraits, by the way. Your model will be like, when's he gonna take a picture? That audible sound of the mechanical shutter is really useful. Um, one downside to the electronic shutter is some amount of rolling shutter. If you're shooting fast moving action, the camera records the action from the top of the picture to the bottom of the picture. So if, for example, you're panning quickly, a straight line will turn into a diagonal line because the bottom of the picture is recorded slightly after the top of the picture. The mechanical shutter eliminates those effects. The electronic shutter is silent, but does have the rolling shutter effect. So pretty much use the mechanical shutter whenever possible and use the silent shutter only when necessary. Let's talk about adapting lenses here. Sometimes you might want to use your Canon lenses, for example, like the Canon 24 to 70 F2.8 is kind of a sharper lens than the Sony version. At least that's what our testing has found with our copies. So I adapt them with 
Our Metabones Mark IV or Mark V adapter, they're essentially identical. They cost about 400 bucks. My favorite adapter is the Sigma MC11, which you can pick up at this link. It's actually, it's only like 200 bucks. We used to use the Metabones. The Sigma is actually a little bit better in all situations and does okay. You will find a native Sony glass always works better than the adapted Canon glass. If you are going to use a dumb adapter other than these, or you're going to use a lens, for example, uh, some Chinese manufacturer lens that doesn't have electronics built into it, there are two settings that you'll want to adjust. For one, you'll need to turn the camera into the release without lens mode, which is under camera tab two, page five, release without lens. Turn that to enable if it's set to disable, but it should be set to, to enable by default. Also go down to steady shot settings and you will have to set the steady shot focal length to match the focal length of the lens. By default, the camera will automatically pick up the focal length if you use native Sony glass or smart adapters, but if you're manually adapting, you'll have to manually set that in order to get the camera's stabilization to work effectively with the lens. I like to set the copyright information in my cameras. It just embeds some metadata in your pictures. Your pictures are copyrighted, at least in the United States, no matter what you do. But I have some fantasy where I lose my camera and then somebody identifies my camera by looking at the copyright info. So I always go into the copyright info here and set right copyright info to on. And then I set the photographer and I manually type my name out. I'm sorry for the user interface here. If you texted in like the 90s, it kind of works like that where if you want to type O, you have to hit this three times and then you have to go that and then, yeah. So I'm not going to keep doing that. I'm just going to leave it set so it's a ton. You get the idea. If you want to format your card, if you've taken all your pictures off and your card's full, you can do that by hitting the menu button here, going to setup five, the little toolbox, and then going down to format. You'll select the card that you want to use and then confirm. A word of warning, if you have saved custom settings to the card, formatting will erase those. So you might have to do this in a different way by manually removing all of the pictures. I'm not going to get in depth about shooting video with this camera but I will give you a couple of tips. It's all pretty straightforward. First, I'll put the mode dial into the movie mode here, which allows me to preview it in 16 by nine. I'll point out that there is no AFS in movie mode. Either you're in AFC where it's continuously, continually focusing or you're in manual mode. If you are in AFS in like aperture priority where you're shooting stills and you start recording, the camera will switch into continuous focusing mode. And continuous focusing is not very smooth. It will jump around and it will arbitrarily jump around even if you're recording a still subject. So for that reason, I highly recommend using manual focus anytime you're doing video here. So switch to manual focus and then use your custom trash can button here to zoom in closely and manually focus. Only use AFC when you're actually tracking a moving subject, otherwise it gets a little bit erratic. If you're on a tripod, turn off steady shot inside because steady shot, when handheld even, can get a little bit weird. Steady shot inside moves the sensor to try to cancel out any camera shake and it can help in some situations, but it can also do like a weird warpy thing so I've had a couple of like serious shoots where I was trying to get a little clip and then I realized, oh my God, everything looks really warpy. To turn that off, you go into the menu system and then it's camera two, page five, steady shot, and you'll set that to off. To change the format of your video, you'll go to camera two and then page one. And there are a couple of options here. File format here allows you to pick between HD and 4K, there's probably no need to ever use AVC HD. So just, I always shoot in 4K whenever I can. 4K is limited to 30p, either at 100 megabits per second or 60 megabits per second. The higher bit rate will have a little bit less compression, which can help in like smooth gradients, it takes up more space, but the video quality is a little bit better. So you can kind of choose your own compromise there. You can also shoot slow motion at 120 frames per second here. That's like four or five times slow motion. To do that, either you can switch to HD mode and then change the record setting to 120, or you can go down to S and Q settings 
choose the record setting. This is just a bit of metadata that's recorded in the file. This is what you plan to play it back at, and then change the frame rate. Usually you'd be at 120 frames per second if you're shooting slow-mo, because why would you record it slower? Once you've set the S and Q settings, you will change the mode dial to S and Q. And so now the camera is ready to record in S and Q slow motion mode. You can also adjust the audio levels while recording video. So hit the menu button here. It's under camera tab two, page two. Ah, you, S and Q does not have audio. And as a result, you can't do it, but I will switch back into regular video mode and go back into that same mode. You can see audio recording is not set to on. And now you can see I'm seeing my levels here and I can select this and kind of raise or lower the levels. Usually I like the loudest sounds to be just like kind of in the right two thirds there. So these levels are actually about right for where I am now. Focus peaking highlights in focus parts of the frame, really high contrast parts of the frame. It's easier to show you than to tell you about it. To turn it on, I'll hit the menu button. I'll go up to camera tab one and then page 14. And then I'm gonna select peaking setting, peaking display, I'm going to set to on. Peaking level, I always have it at low. And then peaking color to something that contrasts the scene. So for example, if the scene is all monochrome, like the screen here, red might be a good peaking color. So now that I have focus peaking turned on, let's hit that trash can button and I'll zoom in tight. And then as I kind of manually focus through here, let me switch it over to manual focus mode. I'm zooming in and now you can kind of see as this gets to being in focus, you can see like this edge of the E here is kind of turning red. This helps me know that I'm approximately in focus. Focus peaking is never as accurate as zooming in, but I use focus peaking to get me close and then I punch in to really nail accurate focus. So pretty much only use this when doing manual focus for either video or macro photography. Zebras mark bright parts of the frame so that you know, for example, where 70% or 100% brightness is in the scene that can help you make sure that nothing's overexposed or it can just help you nail exposure on things like skin tones if you set it to, I don't know, 70%. So to turn on zebras, let's hit the menu button. We'll go to camera tab two, page seven. And then zebra setting. I will turn zebra display on and you can see by default it's set to 70. That's like the standard in film for what you would expose skin tones at. So as I'm adjusting the exposure compensation and the exposure is kind of passing pass, passing through 70%, you can see the parts of the frame that are right about 70% are shown in zebra. So if I were using this to guide, to guide my skin exposure settings, I would adjust it until the skin was in the stripey levels. If I were to set the zebras to 100, I could then verify and see just the parts of the frame that were actually overexposed. So different uses for different use case scenarios. Another setting I wanna point out is anti-flicker shooting. Sometimes you'll see flicker in places that have artificial lights like LED lighting because the camera itself is not synced to the lights. Anti-flicker shooting can delay shooting just a little bit so that the shutter is firing at the same time that the lights are pulsing on because pretty much all lights are pulsing on and off with the electrical rate at wherever you happen to be. So to turn anti-flicker shooting on, something you only want to turn on if you are having a problem with it, go to camera page one, page 15, and then anti-flicker shooting and set it to on. Pixel shift is a specialized mode that takes multiple pictures, shifting the sensor one pixel between every exposure. The previous a7R 3 had a four shot pixel shift mode that served to simply eliminate moiré. This camera also has that four shot mode. The a7R 4 also introduces a 16 shot pixel shift mode that takes four of those four shots sequences shifted half a pixel each to quadruple the 60 megapixel standard resolution to 240 megapixels. In our testing with the 16 to 35 f2.8 GM lens, this produced incredibly detailed images that people could see in big prints. So this is a mode I would love to use all the time, but I can't. Pixel shift is almost impossible to use in real world scenarios. It is 
I've never successfully taken an outdoor shot with pixel shift. In the city, forget about it. Subways, cars, people walking, that's enough to shake the camera too much. Even in the countryside, I found large brick stone buildings are moving so much, imperceptible to the eye, but they're moving so much that it screws up all of my pictures. I've heard it can work with large mountains that have no trees on them, but I haven't had the chance to test, test this. Of course, any sort of movement in the frame causes these weird kind of like hashtag looking effects in your processed picture. So in summary, you want all those megapixels, but you can't have them unless you're shooting like a still life or product photography. And even then, I've only, I have had limited success shooting on the first floor of my house. If I shoot in the basement on a concrete floor with nobody else walking near me and I'm holding perfectly still, then I have close to 100% success. But if I go to the first floor of my house with nobody near me, but maybe the wind is moving the house a little bit, then my success ratio drops to about 50%. Either way, when you're shooting pixel shift, you'll want to take a lot of pictures to make sure that one is effective. Here's my process for using Pixel Shift. First of all, go into the menu system, go to camera tab one, page three, you'll see Pixel Shift Multi-Shoot. Set this to probably the 16 shot mode. Why not at least try it, right? You can always process those photos using the four shot technique and the Sony software later, if that's your choice. So turn that on and this will immediately change you to single shot from continuous shutter. And if you're in AFC, it will switch you to AFS. You cannot use continuous shutter or AFS. When you switch back, those settings will not revert to your previous settings, so you will need to manually revert to those settings. Now that Pixel Shift is turned on, attach the camera to a very heavy tripod and tighten everything down. Put it on the sturdiest floor that you can. Indoors, basement, with no movement anywhere near it. Set the shutter delay to 5 or 10 seconds, or use the remote shutter trigger that I mentioned earlier. Instead of just taking one series of 16 shots, take 5 or take 10 for every one shot that you want to get, because as I mentioned, I have a low success ratio here. Any sort of movement during the entire 16 shot sequence will ruin the entire thing and result in weird hashtag -y looking things. When you're done, you can go back in to the menu system, turn pixel shift back off. Now go back in and change your shutter to continuous shutter if that's what you use and continuous focusing if that's what you use because it does not remember those settings. When you import the pictures onto your computer, Remember, each 16-shot picture is a six, takes up two gigabytes of space. So if you shoot 10 in a row to get one right, you need 20 gigabytes of storage. I do not use the Sony Imaging Edge Viewer app. You can use the Sony app, but I do not like it. What I find much better is the Pixel Shift to G, DNG app, which is currently free. It will automatically go through an entire folder of pictures, find every Pixel Shift group, and then stack them into a DNG, a raw file that you can import directly into Lightroom. That gives you full raw capabilities without having to use Sony's app, and it's just faster. So check it out at sdp.io slash psdng. If there is some motion in the frame, for example, if you successfully got a landscape shot, but you want to take out the moving leaves, then take a single one of those exposures, they'll each be written as a separate file, and blend it back in. It's important to note that the camera itself does not process these into a single file. And if something goes wrong, like there's camera shake, it does not tell you about it. We have customized so many different settings. You probably wouldn't want to lose all of those settings. So it's really useful that Sony is now allowing you to write all the settings to a DAT file on your SD card. To save your settings, hit the menu item, go to the toolbox, go to page seven, and then do save load settings. Select save and then it will allow you to create a new setting, which it will call CamSat 0 something. So you can save CamSat 1, 2, 3, 4. Once you've saved those, you can put your SD card into a computer and go in and rename those files with up to eight characters and .dat. So you can see that's how I have Tony and Pixel Shift, and then Basic. Those are three settings that I've customized that I regularly fall back to. Basic is almost the default settings, and I use that for troubleshooting in case something is going wrong. Tony, 
is my regular shooting style. And then pixel shift is when I want to shoot in pixel shift mode because I do things like set up a delayed shutter and I find it easier to load the settings from the memory card than I do to manually change all of them. Once I'm done with pixel shift, I will load the Tony settings again since pixel shift does change several settings. If you want to try out my settings on your camera, including all my customizations, use the link that's shown on the screen here and you'll be able to download them. If you save your own custom settings, I suggest you back up those settings because formatting the memory card will erase them and at some point you're probably gonna do that accidentally. When you save these settings, it does not save the custom My Menu. Those things are not saved. When you load them, it does not overwrite them. So My Menu is not affected by loading or saving of those custom settings. Wi-Fi on this camera allows you to communicate from the camera to your smartphone. Sony presumes to make this pretty easy. You can follow the instructions on the camera and you might have some luck with that. To follow the instructions on the camera, hit the menu button, go up to the globe icon here, and then select send to smartphone funk. Select that, select send to smartphone. I usually prefer to select them on the smartphone and then it's going to show you a QR code. In theory, the way this works is you pull out your phone's camera, take a picture of the QR code, and then everything just kind of connects up. So this is my iPhone, it detected the QR code, and then I can open this up. I have had no luck with this, and in fact, now it opened up a search for W01. So maybe they will fix these bugs. I have tried NFC, the QR code thing. I've tried several different ways to get it to work, and none of them have worked. Here is the technique that works reliably for me. I pull up this screen as I just did. You can see it's showing me the, the network name. So I'll go into my settings, I'll select Wi-Fi here, and then I will select that network from the list. On my camera, I will push the trash can button to view the password, and I will manually type this password. And then I will click join. You can see the camera detects this. It starts up the sharing. Now I want to open up the Imaging Edge app, which I've been previously installed. It's Sony Imaging Edge. You can see it says connected with camera. Okay, that's good. So if I select this now, I can actually view the pictures. You can see the red light here is blinking because it's reading stuff from the memory card. From there, you can also save the pictures. Can I just tell you this app is so bad? Like now that I'm in the viewing picture thing, there doesn't seem to be any way to get out of it. It has like two stars in the app store. It's not good. Sony has promised, oh, okay, wait, back just appeared. It wasn't there before. Okay. No, no, never mind. I still can't get out. Sony's promised to update this app, so I hope they will update it. Okay, let's reconnect. I killed the app and ended the connection here and restarted it. You can see this time it had saved my password, so connecting was much easier. I'll restart up the Imaging Edge app. Now I'll show you how to remotely control your camera from a smartphone. This might be good if you want to frame up a picture. From the menu, go to the little globe icon and then select Control with Smartphone. Control with Smartphone, turn to On. Then you select Connection and it will do the same thing we just did. Now on my phone, I'm going to go into Wi-Fi. It might automatically connect or it might not. There it is. Now I'll switch back to the Imaging Edge app, and I got a disconnected message. Disconnected. Okay, so after two disconnecteds, you can see I'm now officially connected and able to remotely control my smartphone for what it is. You cannot touch to select a focusing point or touch to focus at all, and for some reason, my camera's not focusing, but you can take pictures by pushing the shutter button. Okay, there I slid it over and I started taking pictures. That's generally how it works. You can see it's just terrible. So what I suggest instead, if you want to transfer pictures to your smartphone, is use an SD card reader. You can get these for Android devices with either micro USB or USB-C by using these two links here, or for iPhones, uh, iPads, and such with the Thunderbolt connector, head to sdp.io slash AppleSD. Use your JPEG files here because they will transfer much faster. And then I import them if I'm on my phone using Lightroom Mobile available for both 
Android and iPhone. You can get it at sdp.io slash Adobe Deal. This camera also supports Bluetooth and it works about as well as the Wi-Fi, which is to say you can make it work. And when I've gone through the trouble to set up Bluetooth, for example, to do location linking, which will tag my photos with GPS, that sounds great. I went through this trouble in Iceland and it tagged literally two pictures and then it stopped tagging. But the whole rest of the trip, it was trying to communicate and I was dealing with error messages on my phone about location linking and all this and it drained my battery to the point where my camera died and my smartphone battery died and it didn't tag any other pictures. So for that reason, I do not recommend fooling with Bluetooth, at least until they update the app or the firmware to work a little bit better. I've covered so many settings in this tutorial. Some things I suggest not touching are AF micro adjustments. Don't bother, it's a mirrorless camera that really doesn't get screwed up. Don't use pre-AF. Don't adjust the color space from sRGB unless you absolutely have a good reason to do so. And never ever use face registration that's left over from like a long time ago and it sucks. Here are my suggestions for lenses. The Sony 16-35 f2.8 EGM is my absolute favorite lens. It is so remarkably sharp, it's portable, it's fantastic for just events and landscapes, and if you pop it into APS-C mode and crop down, you can get to 50 millimeters and still be at 28 megapixels. It's just such a great lens. Pick it up at this link here. The 24-70 f2.8 is kind of the standard walking around lens, and it's 2200 bucks, but you kind of need it if you're doing this kind of pro-grade work. And completing the Holy Trinity, the 70-200 f2.8, we find this lens to be excellent. It's great for sports and portraits, both. If you get into casual wildlife stuff or more distant sports, the 100-400 lens is even sharper than the 70-200. It focuses even better. It's just generally an overall better lens, except that it's f5.6 instead of f2.8. I mentioned for astrophotography, my love of the Sigma 14mm and 20mm arts. You can pick it up at this lens here. And if you're serious about wildlife, the a7R4 is actually awesome at it with its huge 60 megapixel sensor. You can collect more data more just detail on wildlife than ever possible using the 600 f4 lens and probably the 1.4 or 2 times teleconverter. They both work pretty well. Pick it up at sdp.io slash Sony 600. It's 13,000 bucks, but if you're, lots of people, if you're serious about wildlife, people do that. Don't buy the Sony flashes. I don't love them. <laughs> Instead, I am bought into the Godox system known as Flashpoint in the US. There are a few different names that these kind of Chinese lights go by. They actually work great. And they work with a wide, wide variety of cameras in case you switch systems at some point. For an on or off camera flash, this setup is 225 bucks. It works better than any Sony system we've tested. Check it out at that link there. And if you want actual studio strobes, check out the Godox um, strobe system, especially the Flashpoint Explorer 600 Pro, known as the Godox 600 Pro. These are bigger than flashes, but they allow you to attach soft boxes and beauty dishes and strip lights and all sorts of more complex lighting modifiers that you would want for any sort of studio photography. My favorite two tripods, the Be Free tripod is only a couple of hundred bucks. It's a great general tripod that we've been recommending for like a decade. But lately we've been trying the Gitzo Series 0 and Series 1, especially for travel photography, and they're like a thousand bucks. But they are built so nice, they feel so good in your hand. So, I mean, you did spend 3,500 bucks on a camera, I thought I would suggest it. One nice thing about Godox is they have a specialized quick release plate, which has this little edge here, which hooks under the bottom of the camera and stops the quick release plate from twisting, which in the real world is just this very like practical but simple feature that I really love. And one final plug for my stuff. First, subscribe to the channel. It's free. Give me a like. If you have other suggestions on how to get the most out of your Sony a7R4, write a comment down below. If you just want to express sympathy for the loss of my voice, I appreciate your kind words. And check out my book, Stunning Digital Photography, the number one photography book in the world with more than 14 hours of video, our books on Lightroom and Photoshop, and of course, our art and science video training series, which is more detailed and deeper than we could possibly get into in YouTube. And if you wanna make money with all your expensive gear, check out my pro portrait training series, which is more than just taking portraits. It's about the business of portrait photography. You can pick all those up at northrop.photo or go to Amazon and search for my name, Tony Northrop. Thanks so much and bye.